Hello everyone, welcome back to chapter two. This is the last, we're going to talk about the quantum theory for now. <clears throat> You'll see it over and over again as we go through, but for now, um, what we're going to do is we've, we've already talked about the principal quantum number N and the angular momentum quantum number L, and now we're going to look at the magnetic quantum number M sub L, and we're also going to look at the M sub S, the spin number. So the magnetic quantum number is an integer, and it specifies the orientation of the orbital. So this is where we're, we're saying, is it on the x, y, or z axis? So which plane is it po poking into, right? And the values are negative l to plus l. So, and it does include zero. So if you if you're L, let's say you are a d orbital, okay? If you're a d orbital, that means that L equals two, and so your numbers could be uh, minus two, minus one, zero, plus one, or plus two, right? So when you look at that, you're you're looking at those five orbitals, and you're seeing which um, which orientation it's in. And remember, you can have two electrons in each one of those lobes. So if your L number is one, it would just be, so if L was one, it would be minus one, zero, plus one. And it could be those. It doesn't have to be all of them, but it could be those, okay? The spin number actually, um, it came about because what was happening is um, when you defined where was an electron and you said you gave you said it's in n equals two and l equals zero in the s orbital and m sub l in the x axis okay so you could still there's two electrons in there so you could be describing two different electrons with the same quantum numbers and we can't do that we have to have an individual so what we what they came up with was the spin quantum number saying that you have two electrons in an orbital and they have opposite spins so we say one it's a plus one half and the other is a minus one half and those are the only two numbers that you can have on the spin quantum numbers and that's just so that each of those two electrons that have the same other quantum numbers have a different number at the end. So here's kind of an overview of these quantum numbers. So we said the shell uh, is the n equals, and we said that's the row of the periodic table, all right? And then the n will have an L value, and the L will be 0, 1, 2, three, etc., like that, right? And, and it goes up to n minus one. Um, so then the zero means that it's an S, the L means it's a P, the two means it's a D, and the three means it's an F orbital. Then the M sub L of that, if it's already a zero, it can only be zero. If it's a one, it's, the, it's plus one, zero, minus one. If it's a two, it's plus two, plus one, zero, minus one, minus two. If it's a three, it's plus three, plus two, plus one, zero, minus one, minus two, minus three. And those are the options. And notice that you have one S orbital, so you have two electrons in that one. You have three, one, two, three, right, possibilities. P orbitals, so you can have six electrons in that one. 1s orbital. You can have five d's, so in, and so we draw five of those, so that means you could have 10 electrons in there. And then finally, the f orbital can have one of these, and it would have um, seven f's, or 14 total electrons could be found in the f orbital. So I just kind of give you a graphic so you can visualize it. If you're like me, it's easier to visualize it with an infographic. 
So we didn't talk about wavelengths of light and, and, and what that meant and how to calculate everything because really the only thing that we're interested in in this is the energy aspect of it. Different wavelengths of light have a different amount of energy. Okay, and so the longer the wavelength, the higher the frequency of that energy is, therefore the um, higher the higher the um, energy is. Okay, so if you've got, so if you have a wavelength, if your wavelength is long, okay, I should say it this way, it makes more sense. Okay, a, a long wavelength is slow, okay. A fast wavelength is fast, so it has a higher frequency and higher energy. So this is a short wavelength. So these electrons, when they're moving in between orbitals, we call that an electron transition. What happens is you can excite these electrons. These very readily absorb energy because they have this energy aspect to them. And when it absorbs energy, what's going to happen is it's going to transition from a lower energy level where it normally lives to a higher energy level. Then when it relaxes, because if you don't keep exciting it, that energy is going to desorb, okay? It's going to fall back down to where it was before, or at least a lower energy level. When it relaxes, it gives off a photon of light because that's how it gets rid of the energy. And it's going to equal ever how much energy you put in it, right? Because we have conservation of energy in addition to conservation of matter. So that energy that it releases when it relaxes is the same as the difference in energy between the two orbitals because you have to put that much energy in it to make it go. So let me show you what I'm talking about. So if you have an electron down here in N equals 1, okay? So N equals 1 is the lowest energy and then it goes up from there, all right? And so, say I have an in, uh, say I have a little electron down here, and I hit it with some light, boink, all right, and it's going to go all the way up to n equals three because I zapped it really good. It's absorbed enough energy to move up there. So just like if you had to absorb enough energy to climb up the side of a hill. When you get to the top, though you have stored the amount of energy it took you to get to the top of the hill. If you come back down, then you're going to have to, you're going to release energy as you come back down. And that energy in an electron is released as light. And if it comes down to this, it has to release whatever this amount of energy is, which was the amount of energy it took to go from n equals 2 to n, I mean from n equals 3 to n equals 2, and then it would take another release of energy to go all the way back down to what we call its ground state, which is where it normally lives. Okay, so um, if you if you have ever seen the flame test and you can Google it um, and it'll show you kind of what that looks like, you can take different metals that are elements and you can put them in a flame and when you burn them, they have different colors and that's one of the way that we can figure out what's what. When you do that, um, that color is associated with the wavelength of the light it's emitting and is also associated with how much energy it absorbed and now how much energy it releases when it lets go of it. So it's all about the energy, okay? If your electron goes all the way up here and it normally lives down here, it's not stable and it wants to get back to where it was in that nice low energy. It wants to get back on the couch down here. So it's going to release that energy that it absorbed until it gets back down to that ground state. Okay, so that's our, that's our view of the quantum mechanical theory, quantum numbers, and then what's actually happening with the electrons when we excite them and they move in between 
the orbitals.